All right. All right, everyone, welcome to Map and Compass and GPS Navigation Seminar from Sierra Mountaineering Club. I'm Darren. We've got about 50 minutes or so to talk about this important topic. So thanks for being here um, in person. Thank you all for being here. And those of you who are online, thanks for joining us. So this is an expanded version of what we've taught over the years. It's kind of like a, the stuff we teach in Mountain One. We'll go into much more depth here, but I'll use some of the concepts from that. Um, by the way, Sierra Mountaineering Club is a not-for-profit mountaineering club. Uh, we do climbing of all sorts year-round in the U.S. and abroad, and we're headquartered in California, Northern California. And if you're not already a member, I'd love for you, for you to join us at uh, sierramountaineeringclub.org. Mountain navigation and route finding, for our purposes, are broken into two uh, camps. That'd be a good word to use. One is getting to base camp. That's what we'll call navigation. So that's getting to this point. And another one would be going from camp up on the route. And not surprisingly, that's called route finding. So I describe the, the two of them as both a science and an art. There are some skills that are very straightforward, like methods in math, you could say, or science. But there's also some more um, interpretive aspects to these two skill sets. Okay, So we put them together to find our way through the terrain. Here's some of the tools that we're going to use to do that. I listed these in order of importance. Notice that your native abilities are more important than a topographic map. <laughs> that these are generally your, your uh, ability to observe the terrain and make decisions about it and memorize the terrain. So what you're seeing and what you're thinking about, that's really key. Next would, of course, be the map. Um, a compass with adjustable declination is much preferred. Um, a calibrated altimeter is also really useful. And these other items you can see here are useful in various situations. Uh, if you have these first couple, uh, you're going to be in good shape. So a couple essential skills I want to point out that would be useful for you is if you're going to bring the tools along, make sure you know how to use them. There have been many folks that we've had come with us that have a compass but don't really know what to do with it. Um, that's fantastic, but let's, let's figure out how to use them, and that's why you're here tonight. Translating topography from the real world uh, to the map and vice versa is a great essential skill. So whenever you're out there, practice this. Pick a point in the map that possibly is obscure and see if you can find that point. Establishing and maintaining a position fix is a key component. So never lose track of where you are. That's a position fix. Um, continually gather information as you're moving through the terrain and use that to make decisions about your position fix and um, your position on the, in the landscape relative to your goals. Another one that often gets us in trouble is trusting our sense rather than our instruments. Our instruments don't lie. Um, so as long as they're not broken, they should be uh, telling you exactly um, what is actual truth and not interpretive, like our sense of where we are in the map. And you may make route finding and navigational decisions, and so be humble enough to admit that you've made a mistake and you're now a thousand feet down on the wrong side of the mountain and just fix it. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes poor conditions arrive where we can't see. Uh, low visibility is a key prohibitor of successful navigation, so make sure you're not relying on visual alone. And this thing about going from macro to micro means that look at the big picture, look at the small picture, and go back and forth. Know where you're moving generally in the landscape, but also think about sometimes where your very next step is going to be, like actual next step. Okay? And then so that you can go back and forth, that'll keep you on track. It's not moving forward here. Okay. So to first talk about the topographic map, um, this is a, a basic skill to be able to translate something that's 2D like this into something that's 3D. And topographic lines just follow landscape that's all the same elevation. And there's two types of contour lines on the map. One are these very um, thicker lines that are called index contours. They're dark brown. And then all of the lines in between them are uh, thinner. And they are at intervals between the index contours. So in this case, we're going between 700 and 800. 
So these are going to be in successive steps. Um, so they would each be 20, right? 20, 40, 60, 80, right? And that's the, uh, that's the contour intervals. So here's a picture of uh, a round hill and a peaked hill and what those look like from, uh, from the side, how they might look in reality, and then how they're going to look when, you, when viewed on a map from above. We'll talk more about that coming up here. Okay, so on maps, there are a couple features we need to discuss. One is the declination and compass rows. So that would be this guy here. Uh, on, all maps are built on a grid system, which is actually from the pole to pole of the Earth. And latitude and longitude historically is hung on that. But our compasses, of course, work off of magnetic north, so they're pointing to a glob of iron uh, that's somewhere north of Greenland so uh, currently. And so the difference between those two locally is what we call declination. In Northern California, it's about 13-ish. It's a little, uh, I think it's a little more down south, and it's a, little, it's a little less as you move east. We'll discuss that in a bit. Um, other things you need to know about maps is the colors all mean something. So the contour lines are brown, vegetation is green. If it doesn't have any vegetation, it's white. Anything that's blue, including glaciers, is water. And trails and roads are red and black or man-made features. Um, there's also a scale that shows you how um, large something in the real world will be translated to on the map. So the, the ratio between those two um, is listed here. Scale will be 1 to 100,000 or scale 1 to 20,000. And it doesn't matter what that item is. It could be an inch, it could be a mile. Whatever it is, the scale is the same. Let's go on to the next one. So translating uh, declination and grid north. Um, here's again what we're talking about. True north is the geographic top of the planet. Magnetic north is the declination. Excuse me, magnetic north is the difference between um, true north and magnetic north. The difference between those two is declination. Okay, I just... Hopefully you, don't, you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> so look at here. Just read this. It'll tell you everything you need to know. Um, here we are in Northern Cal, 13 to 15. And it goes to zero over here near Louisiana. And it's more as you move up the coast. Is this not working anymore? Or did I turn it off? OK, the features of a compass. I'll, I'll point them out um, and uh, here and also have them on the slide so you can take a look at them. Come on over and let's, let's, let's get a close-up on a compass here. So here's a typical compass. This would be the base plate and it has this of course magnetized needle which is this red guy here we call Red Fred. Um, this dial here is called the bezel. The index pointer or direction of travel is where the bearing is red and that's here. Um, on a compass that has a sighting mirror like this, it's also this line that goes between these points. So this is the direction of travel. And that actually means that your belly should be here and you're, when you're traveling someplace, you're looking out this end of the compass. So if you were to look at me, I'd be holding the compass like this and shooting my bearing. Mm-hmm. There we go. All right. So I'd be shooting in a direction um, that I'd want. So I'm pointing that out just to let you know that you don't use the compass any other way. Um, there are actually a couple other things I want to I want to show you on the compass close up. So <clears throat> there's some other there's some other lines on here. These these are the parallel meridian lines. They're red lines that are parallel inside of the the dial and those help us to orient the dial to a grid on the map itself. The declination adjustment can usually be done on the back. There's a little key right here you can use to turn this. And the declination is the difference between north and uh, between grid north and magnetic north. So on this compass right here, you'll note that grid north is here, but the red box that Red Fred goes to is at 15 degrees to the east of that. So this compass is set for 
usage in Northern California or so. There's also the sighting mirror, of course, which helps us get an accurate uh, read on a landscape feature. The lanyard helps us to measure distances on the map so we can use this to trace uh, from point A to point B and then straighten it out and get a scale reading on that. There's a magnifying lens. Uh, some of these features are luminous here, so they'll glow in the dark. And uh, this, this sort of compass with these features, I don't know, runs probably 60 to $75, something like that, which is a little bit, but that's good to have all these features so you can navigate effectively. All right, let's see here. Can you move on? Okay, the altimeter uh, is also referred to as an ABC watch. So it's the altimeter, the barometer, and the compass. It also has the thermometer on it. And of course, it's a chronograph because it's a timepiece. It'll give us alarms. Some of them also have heart rate monitors. And even nowadays, you can buy those that are GPS in addition. Let's go on to the next. Could I get this to, to work somehow? I don't know what happened to it. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about GPS. Maybe one of you guys could grab this and see if it could work it. Um, so a GPS is an electronic device that uses satellite signal to pinpoint your location on the planet. And how it does that is it sends signals to the satellite and it receives them from the satellite, which is timed very precisely. And because of the triangulation, same principle that we use in map and compass navigation, it's, it's able to fix a position on the planet. Move on. So um, the, here's the four main functions that it does. Displays your position, records a track log, gives you point-to-point -point nav, and also helps you follow a route of predetermined waypoints. Um, GPS does a couple things that map and, maps and compass alone can't do. One of the biggies is it allows navigation at night and low visibility. So when maps and when a compass, you can't see the terrain, that's the one you want. Um, it gives you an instant location fix, which is altitude and location, which is a little bit better than a map. You can go, go back to where you started, records retrievable data, data on all your travel, guides you in a pre-established tracks, verifies your map and compass assumptions, is a more accurate altimeter because it's not based on barometric pressure but on um, satellite signal, and includes also includes compass. So one would probably argue, well, then why would you even want to do anything else? And of course, uh, the reason that we, that we use it as an additional tool is that for all the wonderful things that GPS does, it still is battery powered and subject to a signal. Right. Whereas the map and a compass are always on. Yeah, like <laughs> Never like lose the, power. There's like a south facing slope right next to me that like, well, maybe I only got three point GPS. I, I'm not sure how. Yeah. But it is actual GPS. It is off the satellites. Uh -huh. But in some circumstances, you don't, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah heavy, heavy tree cover or in cities, it doesn't work as well. So all this gear together, a compass with an adjustable declination and a mirror, topo maps, um, you can get them from various places, but we're looking for 1 to 24,000. That's the standard quad size. It gives you good resolution for navigation. GPS, um, you know, it, it varies, but small and just what you need, not overkill. And an altitude watch. <clears throat> What I'd like to do now is start transitioning into um, going through an actual climb, and we're going to do a little bit of navigation and route finding to accomplish that. And the climb I picked out was Mount Whitney Mountaineer's Route, because it's one that a lot of people are familiar with. And so you're going to get a double whammy. You'll get a chance to virtually climb the route with us and also navigate it. So the first thing to do is to get the map out and understand the, how the terrain lays out and create a mental image of the terrain. And as you go through the climb, one of the things that will keep you entertained and keep you safe is to correlate what's happening on the map to where you are in the actual world. So here we are. We know that there's a road that goes up to the trailhead and a trail that heads essentially south um, to the summit. Okay. Oh, here it is. Right there. Well, this is the main trail. Here's Mount Whitney. Um, we're going to go up the North Fork, which is not listed on this map, but I'll, I'll trace it with you as we go on. So we know that we're starting going, driving to a trailhead, starting at 8,000, terminating at 14, coming back to the trailhead, and we're on a certain, uh, we're going to be traveling mostly west, 
west southwest. So, but as far as the specifics go, um, that's that's what we're going to discuss. So one of the first things you want to do is learn how to orient your map. You can do it by inspection, which is just taking it and looking at the terrain and vert, uh, relative to your position, orienting the map so that if you're looking at Mount Whitney and you're here, that in the real world, Mount Whitney is actually that direction. So if you're here, Mount Whitney's there, you take the map and rotate it until the two line up. That way your map is a 2D shrunk down version of the real world and in the same orientation. You can also do that by using a compass. You could use the compass to place it on the side of the map, orient uh, the compass into north, and then using this edge of your compass, you would place that on the map and rotate the whole thing until your map is actually calibrated by the compass facing north or west or whichever direction it needs to be. <clears throat> Okay, another, uh, well that's just what I just talked about, um, finding a bearing from the map. Okay, one of the bas basic things that we're going to do is uh, shoot a bearing in the field. So, if I'm here at the trailhead and I can see something like Thor Peak, then um, these two locations, then I know that uh, it's somewhat southwest. Um, I could probably pick out Thor Peak by sight, by the shape of it, or I could turn my compass there and I could look at that item that I think is Thor Peak and shoot that thing. I would get a reading on my compass at the, uh, at the, indi at the index pointer right here. That reading I would then compare to the map. And if it happened to be southwest, um, then it's very likely that I was pointing at the right item. Um, so this would be, generally speaking, you know, around, well, what's, what's 180 plus 45? 225, okay? <laughs> under pressure. I can't do math under pressure. <laughs> well, 45 plus 2... 45 plus 180 would be 225, right? Okay, that, that's what it looks like on my compass. So this is 180. Um, west would be uh, 270, okay? And then um, southwest would be 225. So on my compass, I'd be able to determine that. Red Fred would be in the shed at that location once I dialed that in. And it's not going to, to do it now because I'm placing it vertically, but um, your compass would be facing this way. You'd be here, and you'd be shooting towards Thor Peak, and Red Fred would be in the shed at the uh, location on your needle where your index pointer indicates southwest. So I, I think I skipped over something, some vernacular that I'm referring to. Red Fred is the north bearing needle that's usually red and the shed is the box that that needle fits into. So if you don't put red fred in the shed, then your compass isn't actually oriented to magnetic north. Okay, So that's where we start from. Once that happens, then a calibrated compass will deliver a grid bearing for you. So that's shooting a bearing in the field. Did I have one shooting a bearing in the map? Okay. Okay. The other way that you could do it is, uh, do we still have our, our annotations? Oh, that's okay. The other way that we could do it is we can actually line up Thor Peak and our trailhead, for example, with the compass um, on the map itself. So we'll note that we're here. We'll want to go there. Whoops. And we'll draw a line between those two places on the map, either virtually or, or with our eye. And then we'll rotate the, the, uh, rotate the dial until red Fred's in the shed. And that will return a direction for us, which we're saying, generally speaking, is going to be 225. Once we've done that on the map, then we'll pick up the compass put Red Fred in the shed again, and if, if our map is oriented during this process, 
then we should already be pointing directly at the peak. But if not, then we can move the compass until Red Fred's in the shed, shoot our bearing, and at 225, as indicated by our calculations on the map, we should in fact be looking at Thor Peak. So those are important crisscrossed skills. So you could start with the field and go to the map, or you can go from the map to the field. Either way, you're going to verify um, with the back end of the, what you started with. You can go back and forth depending on what makes best sense for you. All right. Some other things that you could use would be the altimeter to keep track of where you're at and some other things here that we can practice. Following a bearing in the field, um, finding your way using, um, using the topographic features. Triangulation would be establishing a fix based on your location between uh, bearings that cross. So you could shoot one, two, three different items and where they cross on the map is likely to be your, lo your location. And then going around an obstacle is, is something that um, is more of a higher level skill but involves drawing a box around um, something to allow you to continue travel. So if you're going a certain direction and you end up with an obstacle in the way, then you want to continue going that direction but you don't know how, then you're going to do a series of 90s around the obstacle, okay, where this distance here is the same as this distance here. You're just going to do a certain number of, certain number of steps out to a point, resume your bearing, do a certain number, those same certain number of steps back on a 90, to the place you would have been if you'd been able to go through the obstacle and then continue on. So that's moving around, and that's going around an obstacle. Some of these are a little too complicated to do in a, in a presentation. <laughs> but those are some things you should be aware of. So pre-trip, we're going to study the map, try to build a mental image, look at photographs, study it or memorize topographic features of the, both the climb and the descent. And then as we're going up there, like I mentioned, gather data, mentally look around, compare it to the terrain. And here's a picture of Mount Whitney itself with the Mountaineers route here um, coming off the right-hand side. And this is, on, this is the way up to Iceberg Lake. So this is the key thing to know. There we go. Great. Okay. Thank you. I am going to get to that climb at some point. <laughs> There's still more slides coming here, but here's some other important information. When is the sunrise, the sunset? Is there going to be a full moon? What's the, what's the weather patterns like? How, hold, how cold does it get? How much snow is there up now? Um, and then major features of the terrain. Where's the trailhead? What elevation is it at? How far is it between there and the camp? Um, how difficult is the approach, the ascent, the descent? Are there things you can use to mark your location on the terrain? significant um, landmarks on the mountain or in the distance of obviously like the summit, any glaciers, ridges, couars, gullies, uh, significant peaks close by, rivers, streams, gendarmes, towers, there's all kinds of things you can use. So the more that you have in your mind and the more that you look at, you'll be able to keep track of where you're at. It's just like navigating in the city, you know? Yeah. It's just different sorts of landmarks. There's one more factor. What's that? Maybe you have cell phone coverage. <laughs> and then you can pull, a, you know, sure. thing Google Maps. Cheating, cheating. No, it's okay. So some other rates of travel. Generally, we are going to stick to one mile an hour, but um, you may want to move that back depending on uh, how heavy your packs are, the difficulty of the terrain, snow cover, and how, how much elevation gain there is over a certain distance. Some other things to look at, trends and conditions of mountain aspects. We're doing pretty good on time. Um, the north, coldest, steepest, snowiest. <laughs> this is the north face, right? Um, this is for northern, uh, the northern part of the planet. Okay. The south one, by contrast, is just the opposite. It's the warmest, the driest, the first to become so. Um, in, in this, this area of the world, it's generally windward. Um, then the two uh, 
Uh, other directions, east is a lot like north. Um, of course, it's the first to receive daylight, but it's often snowy, shaded, and a lot like the north, it's often glaciated and steep, especially in the Sierra. A lot of the routes are on the east because of just the way the granite escarpment rose in this part of the world. The east faces are steep. And then in the west, you're going to have kind of the reverse of the east, which is it's going to be treed. It's going to be windy, possibly, but definitely wetter, definitely a gentler slope. And so that's why a lot of the backpacking routes are on the western side of the Sierra. <laughs> and the climbing routes are in the east, generally speaking, or the north. Okay, some other things that will help us while we're going, um, getting ready for our trip. We need to think about evidence of where, uh, of other people that are on the route. And one of the most prevalent for mountaineering is following tracks in the snow. And whether those are reliable or not is always up for debate. But if you find that someone else has broken trail, then that's a help. You can use that as a source of information, but don't rely on it. Similarly, on rock, there's sometimes these piles that are built. They're called cairns or ducts. There's also sometimes evidence of other climbers like uh, um, bale, uh, bale stations or wrap stations where people have uh, jumped, off the, jumped off the route. Sometimes there's blazes on trees from trails that have been there um, a long time where they have cut one or two slashes in the bark at about head level. So, uh, and then another thing would be just the evidence of a trail itself, kind of U-shaped log cuts where logs have been cut with a chainsaw. That's all evidence of trail building that you can use, even if it's partially or, or mostly covered with snow. A cairn is a duck. It's the same thing. It's a pile of rocks. Yeah. Some common errors that we're going to try to avoid. Um, misinterpretation or overemphasis on route descriptions, which are written by really fit people who have done the route many times, probably. <laughs> so I've found personally that I don't usually match the, uh, the time that the route, uh, that the writers of the guidebook said. So I give myself a lot of latitude there. To, you know. um, gravitating towards gullies is just a factor that occurs because of gravity. Um, it's just you're trying to go somewhere, but your body just doesn't want to fight gravity that much, and so you end up dropping terrain. Or inaccurately assessing terrain, like how tall it is, how far away it is. It's usually taller, farther, and harder than you think. And also, similarly, misjudging your progress on the route. Unless you're really accurate and conservative, if you think you've gone X, you've probably gone only half of that. Um, and failing to recognize and correct your mistakes. So. Just be, be conservative, be humble, and give yourself extra time is kind of the, uh, the rundown of this slide. Sometimes when you're traveling in the mountains, you're going to end up with conditions that make things difficult. So you need to have some backup plans and uh, some strategies in place. One is to remember this thing I said about establishing a location fix and never losing track of that. And we can refer to those as known points. So. If you're on a certain place on the map and you've identified known points all around you, then you can always, as long as you have some sort of visibility, you can, or altitude, or both, you can determine your position on the map relative to those known points. It could be an elevation, it could be a peak, or a ridge, or a lake, or, or many of those things. As you have those known points and you move through the terrain, um, one of the most useful things is to use something that's vertical. Uh, sorry vertical. I meant linear. Also in a straight line, but not relative to the horizon. So that could be a river, a lake, a road, a ridge, or in some cases a topographic line. So we can call those handrails. Um, anything that's, that has some sort of linear nature like that has a beginning and an end. Okay, Whether it's straight or not doesn't matter. And relative to our position, we can use those to judge what progress we're making through the terrain. So a ridge, a stream, a road, those are all useful handrails. And you can think of them as like something that you can follow. Then aiming off is a technique that we use when we're trying to get to a destination and want to make sure that if we're using a linear feature as a, a place to stop, um, if we're trying to, then we'll know which way to turn when we, uh, when we get there. So if we were to shoot for A, we're over here. If we were to shoot for A, and this is a particular direction here, okay, let's say it's 
um, 90 degrees because that's easy the way I drew it on the map, okay, on my map here. If we were to arrive at this linear feature here, how would we know whether to turn left or right? So instead of aiming directly at A, what we're going to do is go here, which is 95, and then when we get to that location, we know that we have to turn left, okay? That would help us to avoid the confusion about whether we're uphill or downhill of our destination. So we intentionally aim off so that we know which way to turn to get to our destination using this linear feature as a handrail. What did I get here? And then the last one I want to tell you about is kind of a specialized, specialized one, the contour tangent method. So let's imagine that we have a conical shaped mountain, okay, or similar or, or somewhat conically shaped, and our base camp is at a certain elevation. Let's put it over here again. It's at a certain elevation and a certain direction from our position. And let's say that we're, uh, we're on the mountain. We have an altimeter. We're on this ring here. Okay, we have an altimeter, but we don't really know which direction to descend to get to our base camp. So what we could be doing is we could be shooting down the fall line. And if we shoot the fall line, even in poor visibility, and we come up with zero, we know we're facing north. So what we have to do is by using this elevation, we can ring the mountain until we shoot the fall line and the, the shot that we get down the fall line is 90. Then we know that we can descend from that elevation on an eastward bearing down to the elevation where our camp is at. So of course mountains aren't always conically shaped, okay? But generally speaking, by shooting the fall line, shooting directly down the slope and rotating around the mountain, we can decide, you know, knowing where our base camp is, we can decide where we're going to descend to try to hit that base camp. So that gives us, that gives us a good chance of finding our base camp even in low visibility. So this is a good technique for descending in bad weather. All right. Oh, okay. So you basically hit the elevation and then just circle? Yeah, you could you could hit that elevation and then um, and then you could you could traverse around the mountain knowing what elevation it is. Yeah. So yeah, it's a really uh, it's a great great technique for climbers to know. All right. Okay, I think we're now going to start our climb. So. <laughs> Mount Whitney Mountaineers route. So I've got a couple photographs that were taken actually on the route itself. Let's preview the route. We're going to start at the trailhead, the end of the road. It's 8400, I believe, from memory. Um, and then we're going to follow this yellow line and these little black dots show us um, where it goes. Um, we take the normal trail, go up the north fork of Lone Pine Creek. We're going to go through a section called the Ebers Bacher Ledges. I'll show you a couple pictures of that. Our first possible location is Boy Scout Lake, which is around 10 and a half thousand. And then looking up from there, we have another portion of the trail that goes up to Upper Boy Scout. And these are all elevations by, from memory. I could look at the map, but I don't want to spend the time doing that. So I think it's around 11.2 or some, or 11. And then another one, another possible location would be Iceberg Lake, which is, which is like, oh, 12 or something, 12 and a half, it's pretty high, higher than you probably want to go. <laughs> I've camped at all three of these locations, and the travel between, the, between them is interesting and indicative of a very typical mountain climb. From upper, from Iceberg Lake, we're going to go up the chute, which takes us from essentially 13 to 14,000 to a big, to a bench on the north side of Whitney, and then we'll turn directly south up the north gully and go up 500, essentially 500 feet to the summit plateau at 14.5. So those, that's the rundown of what we're going to do. So driving out there, uh, the first thing we're going to notice is this massif in the distance. And um, what we're going to see is that that's Mount Whitney there. And then we've got these other pinnacles that radiate down. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank Scott for helping me out with my uh, <laughs> online with all the circling and pointing. And the north fork of Lone Pine Creek is, is right in this area here, okay? 
So that's the gulch that we're going to be heading up. There's the map again. I think I've described it enough, so I'm going to skip this slide. Here we are walking up the trail. In the distance is Mount Whitney. Okay, And the North Fork of Lone Pine Creek is right in here. So we're facing essentially west at this point. We get to a sign that says North, that says Lone Pine Creek. Hey, all right. We know that we were heading directly west. We need to turn and go right now so that we can go more northwest. Okay. So we've just accomplished this much of the climb, and we are right here at this junction um, where we're going to now go up the North Fork of Lone Pine Creek. And our direction of travel is going to be pretty much due west, so we could use our compass to establish that and look at the landmarks on both sides. We're in a deep gulch, and we could check our altitude and the canyon walls at, at this point. We come to the ledges, and we're going to um, curve back on ourselves. And at one point, we're actually going to be facing back to Owens Valley. So um, we're, this, is, this is definitely the case. So here's the pictures of that location. And fits the description in terms of elevation and um, what we read in the route description. Here's our little S that we just did. That was the ledges. And we'll continue traversing up the ledges to uh, not up the ledges, but up the canyon to Lower Boy Scout Lake, which is around ten and a half thousand. Here we are at Lower Boy Scout Lake. Um, the lake is down here at the bottom. And now looking west, uh, per the uh, information that we see on the map, we can see that, in fact, there is a route that we trace up these ledges. And here would be Mount Whitney itself. And Upper Boy Scout Lake is going to sit right about here. So in our mind's eye, we could actually shoot these with the compass if we'd like and compare that to the map and say, yep, that's right. Or no, it's not. <laughs> We're in the wrong valley. And then here's Thor Peak off to our left, which is a major, major landmark. So if you look, let's look at the map now. Upper Boy Scout Lake. Uh, we would notice, sorry, we're at uh, Boy Scout Lake down here. And so we would notice that Upper Boy Scout Lake would be hidden by this slope here. And of course we can't see it. And then here would be Thor Peak. That's just, below, just on the other side. So our travel pattern is going to be to come up this curving valley at the foot of Thor Peak to Upper Boy Scout Lake. So I'm just trying to take you mentally through the process of navigating through the, um, through the, um, on the way there. This is below Lower Boy Scout Lake on your way up. Your mapper is behind those trees up in the background, right? The I'm sorry. Boy, the Upper Boy Scout Lake is behind the trees. Yes. Uh, that that was that was a slide. I was ahead of myself. That was a slide getting up to Lower Boy Scout Lake. Okay, so now we're going, um, we, we've, we've been to Upper Boy Scout Lake, we're going to move up to that point, and whether this is day two or day one, um, we're, we're moving up, and in the distance now we see these pinnacles and Mount Whitney also to the right, so we're circling around to get to the upper elevations. Pinnacles are on the map? The pinnacles are Keeler Needle and Crooks or Day Needle. And uh, we're now traveling. That, that photograph was taken from about here, yeah. okay? We're just above Upper Boy, Upper Boy Scout Lake. And now um, we've moved a little further. We're now here, okay? They're, they're getting a little bigger. We're still going the same direction. And now we're yet further. We're getting ready to make the traverse. And then here we are at Upper Boy Scout, I'm oh, sorry, at Iceberg Lake with the chute in the distance still facing west, so we're at about 13-ish or so. What we just did there was that photograph and, and this photograph. So the, the tent that you saw dug in was right here. So the, the route should be directly west from us there and we should uh, increase in elevation to 14. And now we're going to zoom in on this part of the map. Here's our panorama that we should study. 
looking one direction, here's our route, the Mountaineer's route. That's the bench at 14K, and then the last 500 feet would be out of sight. And uh, the summit, of course, there. <clears throat> and uh, this is just looking kind of left and kind of right, and it's the same, same thing. So from a diff different perspective. Those are almost identical, but. <laughs> All right, so now uh, moving up the route, we're gonna show you photographs at different places. This would be in the route itself. Now we're looking down at our tent, which would be in this. Yeah, that, that's Iceberg Lake, thank you. And then the tent would have been over here, okay? The route that we, I wanna put, uh, just mentally put Upper Boy Scout Lake right here. It's behind, it's lower and behind this rocky buttress. And the way that we traveled to get up here was like this, okay? Great, so I want you to just build this in your mind. Think about the, um, the travel patterns, both up and down the route. It's good, they say, to look back on the route as you, as you uh, go up it. So that photograph was taken from about here, looking down, and we just traced all that stuff out. There's our tent, okay? And now we're gonna go to the bench and look at uh, pieces of the route as we traverse through the steps. So the last 500 feet are gonna be important. <clears throat> this is almost at the bench, looking back down about 1,000 feet or so down the route. As we turn the corner, we'll encounter a third-class rock section, which may or may not look just like this, depending on whether you're there in winter or summer and how much snow there's been. So those two photographs were not very far apart. They were just in this space here on the last 500 feet. And at this point, we're traveling south. Uh, we should, by looking down, let me, let me look, no, that's coming up. By, okay, here we are. Now, this is, this is an interesting photograph because we're looking now, we're, we're traveling south up the slope. So if we turn the other direction and look north, we should be looking down the slope. So this view down the slope here can't go back. This view down the slope is actually looking down here. Um, there's, a, there's a very large ridge here, which is very prominent. So we came up, we crested that ridge, we're at the bench, and now we started climbing the, uh, the north chute. And by looking south, we're looking on the back side of this ridge, and that would match the map. Okay, let me go forward. So there, there, here's the ridge line. We, we crested the, the bench is right about here. And here's what, we're, here's what it looks like on the back side. So. And then the final snow, the last couple hundred feet or so. And that was taken from right about here. Okay. Whoa, sorry. And now we're on the summit of Whitney. So that collectively, that's the, pro that's the process we go through to accomplish a climb. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. All right, hopefully that was useful information. I didn't gloss over too much too quickly. but um, So that's, that's what we're trying to help you all learn. So navigating to base camp, going on the route. I think one of the main things that I would just wrap up with is Pay attention to where you're going and, and look at the landmarks and not don't just use the map and the compass, but all the tools you have as a collective whole so that you can make your way through the landscape successfully. So thanks for supporting the club so we can um, provide these free seminars to you. Thanks for tuning in online. Thanks for being here in person. Um, we're going to shut down this part in a second here, and then we're going to boot back up again in a little while with seminar part two, altitude physiology. So thanks for being with us, and have a good evening.